Hey there, once again, YouTube. Just two updates for you, real quick. Uh, remember up here a few days ago, we did have a magnitude 4.6 earthquake and 3.5 shock, which uh, jolted us awake in the middle of the night. I believe it was about 2.31 a.m., I think, or 2.51 a.m., or something like that. Jolted us awake, my bed was rattling, the uh, the TV was wobbling, it was pretty crazy. First earthquake that I've felt since the 2001 6.8 Disqually event. Just want to let you know that we do have two new aftershocks here. A magnitude 2.4 at 27.9 kilometers in depth, and two, uh, excuse me, a 1.7 at 28.4 kilometers in depth. Both reportedly felt by people in the area. Let's look at the 2.4 and see if I was paying attention if I would have felt it. Let's see, 34 people reported feeling it. Let's see right down here. Let's see, I live in this area right here, so I definitely would have felt it if I was paying attention. I believe this was last night. People farther than Marysville felt it and down to southern Seattle and near Bremerton. People reported feeling this 2.4 aftershock. It's pretty far away from the epicenter, guys. Now, something I noticed was this. Here we are at the PNSN custom map. You just go to earthquakes right here. Go to custom search and do what you wish. This is for the Monroe area and the Lords Hill Regional Park area, which felt this earthquake the strongest. There's the 4.6 that woke us up. We live, uh, I'm thinking maybe 10, 15 miles to the max to the southwest from here. So we felt it pretty good. Uh, I just want you to notice how I thought this was very strange. Going all the way down, most recent is at top, oldest is down here. So the 4.6, of course, occurred first, and the 3.5 aftershock occurred after, about two minutes after. Notice the magnitudes of the aftershocks right after the earthquake. Mid-range ones, do you notice that? Then it calmed down for a little bit, and then we saw 1.4, and then a 2.0, then a 2.3, a 1.6, and then a 2.5. Notice how the magnitudes were growing right there. And we also saw 2.4 today and a 1.7. So I thought that was very interesting that the aftershocks, quote unquote aftershocks, if these really are aftershocks and not foreshocks. It's interesting how the foreshocks were smaller afterwards and um, did not occur as much but got larger, almost one unit magnitude larger, which is very strange. You know, of course that is possible with aftershocks. But in from what I've seen... I expect aftershocks to die down in intensity and in magnitude after a few days. And it's still not dying down. We're still seeing some mid-range twos popping off here and there. Some high ones as well, like the 1.7. So we're going to do some. We're going to go to analyze. Going to draw. Now we're going to use point A right over here. Point B right over here. Going to take this box, spread it out like so. Okay. So we're going to see a cross-section of these events. So imagine you're underground and looking that way, right? It's a horizontal cross-section. Right there. Notice from point A to point B, it's like we're looking towards the northwest, right? And this is how they are striking. Now I want you to also see something as well. Let's go to magnitude versus time. And let's press plot. Okay, so of course right over here we have the 4.6 and the 3.5, but look at the magnitudes of the aftershocks. Notice how they were dying down, they were getting pretty small, and then, boop, it started to rise right there. Nothing too crazy, barely even reached 2.0, it actually did reach 2.0. Then there was a big space of time, well, I'm going to say probably a whole day almost. Then we saw 2.3, I believe that's the 2.3, and then we saw the, or no, excuse me, I think that was a 2.1 actually? And then this one, no wait, that was the 2.3, sorry. And then we saw 2.5, some mid to high range ones, and then another 2.4 today. Why are the magnitudes getting larger? I know they're not occurring as much, but do you notice that? That is strange for these aftershocks in this area, especially since it was only a 4.6. I know a 4.6 really isn't a small quake, but I don't know. It's strange how the aftershocks, if they are aftershocks, are still occurring. Now, could these be four shocks? It is possible. That possibility always exists, but really, there's no way to tell if something is four shock until the main shock happens. For example, in California, the magnitude 6.4, they thought that was it, right? And they had multiple aftershocks dying down slowly, slowly, slowly. And then all of a sudden, boom, they got hit by a 7.1 a day later. You know, four shocks could occur multiple years before the main shock? Yeah. 
that's usually when subduction zones that that happens. But we do see it kind of in a linear formation right here. You see that? Kind of, let's go to a depth plot. Here's a depth plot. The largest event, which was the 4.6, occurred the deepest. And the aftershocks were occurring just above it. And the larger quakes, the twos that we've been seeing, have been occurring near the same depth as the 4.6. So it's seeming like the smaller events are up top, the larger events are at the bottom. I thought that was very interesting. Again, it's looking like the energy, or whatever, is traveling towards the southwest, right towards me. Woohoo! And coincidentally, right towards the southern Whidbey Island Fault Zone, which resides... I, I showed that in one of my last videos, which goes all the way up to the Strait of Juan de Fuca, 90 miles to the southeast, all the way down here to about Duval, right in that area. That I believe that's right where the SWIF ends. Notice how the energy is somewhat going towards the... Southern would be on fault zone, which is capable of a magnitude 7.4. Not saying a bigger quake is coming, guys. I really hope not because I live near here, guys. I'm pretty close to this area, so this area would be particularly devastated during a 7.4. Really not looking forward to that if that ever occurs, but it has been 3,000 years since the SWIF has ruptured. That's a long time for a fault not to see any major activity, guys. So just keep an eye out for that. I just wanted to let you guys know about that. Here you have seismic station BHW in the UW network. Dash dash location code because none's given. Short period vertical. So it does look like we have the 2.4 right here that many people felt, which I should have felt if I was paying attention. Probably did feel it, just didn't even notice it. Let's go to the spectrogram. High range frequencies. Right there. And then here's the 1.7 afterwards. Right here. Very strange P wave. The P waves on a lot of these earthquakes are very strong, which I find very, very intriguing. So. That's it for right there. Let's hope it stays calm. Uh, down here, we do see some very strange low-frequency activity, which I, I could be tectonic tremor, but it only really occurs during the day, daytime hours, right? And this is Pacific time, by the way, and this station is in the Pacific time area. So Pacific time would be on the left right here. So you can tell every single time the day starts, notice right up here around 7.30, we see that activity. Then around the evening time, it starts to calm down. Then we see right in the in the morning it starts to pick up, and then probably uh, this evening it's going to calm down as well. That is almost always environmental factors such as traffic and other things that are caused by humans because you barely even see it at all during the nighttime. So I will continue to keep an eye on this, especially since this is very hitting very close to home. Let's hope that these are aftershocks and not foreshocks, but do you think it could be the cascade theory applying to these possible foreshocks? The previous evidence came from a 7.6 magnitude earthquake in 1999 near Izmit, Turkey that killed more than 17,000 people. That's only 0.2 magnitude large, or, yeah, larger than the magnitude that we could get if the whole SWIF goes off. A 2011 study in the journal Science found that the deadly quake was preceded by a series of small foreshocks, potential warning signs that a big seismic event was imminent. We've gone back to the Izmit earthquake and applied new techniques looking at seismic data that was not available in 2011. We found that the four shocks were just like all other small earthquakes. There was nothing diagnostic in their occurrence that would suggest that a major earthquake was about to happen. I agree. Four shocks, you don't know they're four shocks until the main shock happens. I mean, there is kind of, I mean, if magnitudes are slowly getting larger and larger and larger, it's probably safe to assume that maybe a larger quake is coming. Because usually aftershocks die down in both size and intensity the farther you get away from the, uh, from the time that the earthquake occurred. Now we'd like we'd all like to find a scientifically valid way to warn the public before an earthquake begins. Unfortunately, our study doesn't lead to new optimism about the science of earthquake prediction. Scientists have proposed two ideas of how major earthquakes form, one of which, if scientists could detect them, could warn of a larger quake. About half, half of all major earthquakes are preceded by smaller foreshocks, but foreshocks only have predictive value if they can be distinguished from ordinary earthquakes. One idea, known as the Cascade Model, suggests that foreshocks are ordinary earthquakes that travel along a fault, one quake triggering another one nearby. And so that, pretty much that would mean that the magnitude wouldn't get smaller with time. Because with aftershocks, guys, you really should be seeing magnitudes get smaller with time. That really is what should happen. Maybe there could be some bigger aftershocks here and there, but really overall, you should see aftershocks dying down in both size and intensity again. A series of smaller cascading quakes could randomly trigger a major earthquake, but
but could just as easily peter out. That is very true. In this model, a series of small earthquakes would not necessarily predict a major quake. It's a bit like dominoes. If you put dominoes on a table at random and knock one over, it might trigger a second or third one to fall down, but the chain may stop. But sometimes you hit that magic one that causes the whole road to fail. Now, I am in no means saying that that is what ha what's happening here in Monroe. I'm just saying it's a possibility, and I live here right in this area, so I, it's always better to be prepared, guys. Know what's going to happen, or possibly could happen, and prepare for those possibilities. I think that's definitely a good thing to do. So, one possibility is that these are definitely aftershocks. Another possibility is that these are definitely foreshocks. See? Either way you go, guys. You really don't know until the main shock hits. But again, let's go to magnitude versus time. You see them occurring along the fault, trending towards the uh, northeast and southwest. Magnitude's dying over time just after the 4.6 that woke us up not too long ago. And magnitude slowly increase and could be starting to decrease. So this could just be a blip in the radar. I don't know. But it is interesting nonetheless that magnitudes seem to have been larger over the past few days than they were directly after the earthquake which is opposite of what I would expect for aftershocks. Very interesting. So what do you think? Could these be aftershocks or could these be foreshocks? Let me know in the description box below. Here we have one day all magnitudes at earthquake.usgs.gov for Hawaii. They're only reporting six, but remember HVO reports many more than USGS does on earthquake map. Just go to volcanoes.usgs.gov, select the volcano you want, for example, Mauna Loa or Kilauea. And for example, here I'll show you. Now on this map, right here at volcanoes.usgs.gov, you'll see exactly what is reported by USGS, not the HBO. If you want to see actual data for the past week, the past month, and the past year, you would have to click data right here. So just go to the volcano you want, Mauna Loa or Kilauea, and click here. Let me show you an example. Let's go to data past week for Mauna Loa. Now for Mauna Loa alone, just Mauna Loa, I'm not talking about the whole big island and Kilauea and everything, I'm talking about just Mauna Loa, in the past week, there have been 65 available earthquakes at the Mauna Loa area from July 9th to July 16th. Now, if we go to the Earthquake USGS website, let's go all the way up to seven days all magnitudes. It might take a second because my computer will lag out pretty bad because of the amount of earthquakes. Come on, buddy. Okay, so it shows 62 earthquakes for the whole island in the past week. But this shows 65 for just Mauna Loa. So that right there shows that HVO reports many more earthquakes than USGS does on their webpage. I don't know why, since HVO actually is a part of USGS. So if you really want to know how many have been occurring in the past week, past month, past year, or past five years at Mauna Loa or Kilauea, just go to here, click monitoring, this tab right here, and then click data, or one of these right here. But what I wanted to talk about were the two earthquakes that recently struck at 34.6 kilometers in depth and 46.7 kilometers in depth right here. I always keep an eye out for earthquakes uh, being reported for the Pahala area, just south of uh, Pahala, Hawaii, right in this area right here, which is the location notorious for spasmodic tremor in Hawaii. Now, a lot of the earthquakes lately, because uh, sometimes they report them as quote-unquote other event, or sometimes they just report them as regular earthquakes. So I just like to keep an eye on it to see if any more spasmodic tremor have occurred. A lot of the Pahala earthquakes that have been re being reported lately have actually been normal earthquakes. They've actually been normal run-of-the-mill earthquakes occurring very deep, again, likely within the mantle plume. But these two, these two right here, let's go to TRAD on the slopes of Mauna Loa, and looky looky, we have a pretty strong spasmodic tremor event as of the past 12 hours, as of 12.20 p.m. Pacific Time, July 16th, 2019. We'll take a look at it in the Seismic Program Swarm in a second. Just to make sure this isn't surface noise, let's go to another station many miles away. Past 12 hours, we see spasmodic tremor there as well, showing up on all the seismic stations around the Big Island of Hawaii. Let's go all the way north. Now, if you ever think these are, surf these are caused by surface interference or surface noise, just look for a station many miles away on the Big Island of Hawaii, because these are occurring deep within the mantle plume. So if these really are spasmodic tremor events, we should see it appear somewhat on KKUD. And that is what we see. We see it here as well, past 12 hours, as you can see. So it showed up on all across the Big Island of Hawaii, on every single, basically every single station. Even some of the stations that do not record data as well. They, oh, I don't know why that one glitched out. Let's go to T-O-U-O. Right here, see, showed spasmodic tremor at the same exact time as well. 
So we did see some spasmodic tremor. Now, if you're wondering what spasmodic tremor is and what its, its importance is and what is causing it and where it's occurring, please come to this go-to page here, Hawaii Spasmodic Tremor, what is it, where I detail the spasmodic tremor on July 4th through 5th, 2019, but this is more along the lines of a go-to page for people who want to learn about spasmodic tremor when my observations have been, and some of the professional observations as well, like their reported depths and stuff like that. Uh, I have a lot of observations here. Here's one of the strongest ones I ever saw, which was on January 23rd, 2019. And I show you where it's occurring, why it is occurring, and my eight observations that have to do with spasmodic tremor in Hawaii. And yep, so that's it right there. I'll leave a link to this in the description box below. But again, my Hawaii blog is under seismic events by location Hawaii right there. So we do see many earthquakes have been occurring around Hawaii. A lot of them, actually. Some really teeny tiny ones, but they're still seeing a lot of earthquakes there, guys. Some of them occurring in Mauna Loa, some down near Pahala, some along the Kilauea East Rift Zone and Summit Area. Here's spasmodic tremor for July 16, 2019. Yeah. Look how strong this is, guys. Look at this. It's not the strongest, though. The strongest, I believe, went up to about a 1,000 amplitude count on the closest seismic station. This did not... Uh, but then again, we see another spasmodic tremor event right here. Let's go to the spectrogram, shall we? Oh, yeah, typical spasmodic tremor event. It looks just like one really long earthquake, doesn't it? But actually, this is showing tremor and earthquakes basically at the same exact time, guys. Let's zoom into the main part of spasmodic tremor event. Oh, sorry, guys. Frozen there. That's weird. Started at a proc. There's a few little teeny tiny quakes and possible tremor prior to this, but I'm going to focus on the main spasmodic tremor event. Let's see, it started at, I'm going to say, 1050 UTC and ended at about 1130 UTC. So, about 40 to 42 minutes long. So, it's not the longest and it's not the strongest that I've ever seen, but it definitely is one of the strongest in the past few months. So, spasmodic tremor continues in Hawaii, guys. Magma plume recharge is occurring. Let's see here. Yeah, you can see a lot of these are little teeny tiny earthquakes with some type of tremor in the background. Possibly showing the flow of magma within the mantle plume. That is my theory. That's what I believe it is. And there is some good proof to back it up on that page on my website. If you want to check that out again, link in the description box below. I might make a post about this just real quick on my Hawaii blog, so keep an eye out for that. I sadly still have not put out the Mount Hood Earthquake Swarm blog post yet. I've been putting that off for a long time because I've been doing a lot of stuff and pretty busy, but that'll be out there soon enough. The seismic audio to that is actually pretty cool. So that's, that's it for right now, guys. Hope you guys have a great day. God bless, and I'll see you later.